This is not a video about the ills of capitalism or the horrors of colonialism and imperialism, systemic racism, or anything like that. Okay, I guess America's made a few mistakes. This video is about land, water, and political boundaries. And the story I'm gonna tell you begins in the year 1878. 1878 was the year that the American explorer and geographer John Wesley Powell published his plan for how to divide up the arid western U.S. into political divisions not based on arbitrary grids of lines and squares, but based on the natural divisions of landscape. The hills, mountains, saddles, and ridges that divide the country into watershed basins. You see, by 1878, the United States had laid claim to the entire territory between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, brutally enforcing that claim upon the hundreds of native tribes who had their own long legacy of land divisions based on climate, languages, cultures, and practices. At the behest of the president, Ulysses S. Grant, Powell trekked all over the arid west floating down the Colorado River and exploring its tributaries, journeying over mountains and through valleys in order to report back to Washington his findings and recommendations for how to best organize and settle the masses of European immigrants that were flooding across the country from east to west. He returned to Washington and presented this colorful map to the U.S. Congress that illustrated his suggestion for how to divide up the state's borders in the arid west. I expanded his drawing to show what the entire nation would look like with watershed boundaries as state's boundaries. Now, Powell was not perfect. He was a proponent of colonization, which many will name as America's biggest mistake. But he presented an idea that if it had been taken up, would have had an absolutely seismic effect on the governance and land management to this very day. Powell basically said that the government would be foolish to just plop a grid of property ownership in states' lines over the arid western U.S. because the scarcity of water dictated that communities needed collective management over that precious resource. You see, the branches of the watershed are like a tree surrounded by high ground that encompasses a drainage basin or watershed. A watershed is a complete hydrologic unit where the actions at the top of the watershed, like deforestation, impact the water quality, quantity, and flow rates down below. The watershed is a complete and connected unit that is at its healthiest when managed as a unit. But in order to turn land into a commodity that could be easily bought, sold, and controlled, it was divided into a grid of squares, rectangles and right angles. So when you place a grid of property ownership over this non-gridded natural pattern, then a whole host of problems arise. So first off, in an area with scarce rainfall, the owner who gets this piece of the grid down where all the streams come together will have way more resources and better soils than one of these squares that's further up within the watershed. This creates for an unequal distribution of wealth based on access to water and farmland and sets up the conditions for conflicts to arise between neighbors as well as between states. C, the owner of the lower squares where the water is concentrated can manage the water when it flows onto their property at the bottom of the watershed tree but cannot manage water any higher up in the watershed than within their property boundary. So there's no common management or recognition that these parcels are inherently connected to each other through the pattern of water flow. At the same time that these lower squares have the best water resources, these squares here at the top will probably have the best forest resources. So one owner can buy these squares and log off all the trees and cause massive erosion and landscape dehydration downstream without any legal consequences. Or they can excavate a mine and use toxic chemicals which poison downstream water supplies. But because these are seen as separate squares of property ownership and not as a connected hydrologic unit, then the person with all the water and good soil at the bottom can't do anything about soil erosion and pollution above them. 
So you can see that there are inherent problems in the placing of this grid of property ownership atop the branching watershed pattern. They are incompatible. What Powell proposed was not only to divide states along watershed boundaries, but counties as well. And he proposed there was no private ownership of water, but that it would be a public resource that was managed by the occupants of the watershed only, and that water would not be transferred between watersheds. So no massive landowners or corporations could monopolize the resources. So all political governance would correspond with watershed governance. I propose that the USA would be a much stronger democracy if political governance and watershed governance were one and the same. This term was coined watershed democracy. Another important word to learn in the telling of this story is geomorphic. Geomorphic means to conform to the shape of the land. So Powell was proposing geomorphic political boundaries. And when we think about the long-term repercussions of that, it's astounding. Imagine for a minute that the Senate had accepted Powell's watershed democracy instead of rejecting it when they took it up for debate in 1890. If the basic development and political boundaries had been drawn on a geomorphic pattern, then I can imagine a lot of other development transcending the grid of squares and right angles as well. C, superimposing the grid over a non-gridded landscape creates a whole host of other problems. Let's think about how this may have affected urban development. Now, this is reminiscent of a typical suburban grid of houses that covers much of the United States. There are a lot of variations, but plenty of neighborhoods look just like this. The grid of property ownership means that roads are typically laid out along the compass directions north, south, east, and west. So regardless of the topography, this grid of streets is laid down in the compass direction. This impacts water flow. In most cases, the streets replace the old creeks and drainages and act as the new water flow lines, with storm drains collecting and draining water straight down the roads regardless of the topography and hydrologic effects. We can see some extreme examples like San Francisco or Seattle. These are wet places, yet the paving and street orientation literally drains the water off the entire city. So even in a wet environment, you can create a hydrologic desert with groundwater depletion because the street orientation is draining all of the water away. But water is not the only issue. Another big impact of the grid is energy consumption. Now, I'm going to make a bit of a leap here and say that if we were paying attention to development patterns in relation to the landform, we would also naturally start paying attention to development in terms of the sun. You see, in the northern hemisphere, the sun rises in the east, arcs throughout the southern sky, and then sets in the west. Especially in the wintertime, the sun's angle is low on the horizon. So when a building is elongated on the east-west axis and oriented towards the south, it receives the bulk of the sun's rays through the coldest times of the year. This is the foundation of passive solar design. It turns out that when a house is oriented towards the south like this, it stays warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. You can literally use the sun for all your heating needs in a sunny climate with a well-designed passive solar house if it's oriented on the east-west axis facing south. Passive solar house orientation is the simplest thing that you can do to save tons of energy in heating, cooling, and lighting. But if your house is oriented on the north-south axis, then you're really starting in a deficit. Because for a house like this, the west side, which is the hottest direction of the sun in summer, is receiving the full blast of the setting sun and necessitates cooling in many climates. And then the smallest side of the house is facing south, so it loses out on passive heating in winter. So when we jump back up here and look at the average urban or suburban residential grid, we find that typically half of the streets are running north to south and half of the streets are running east to west. So literally, half of the houses in America are oriented the wrong direction for optimum solar gain. And only the houses that are on the east to west elongated streets have an optimum orientation. And then of those homes, 
that are on streets with good solar orientation, only half of those are gonna have a lot of the windows facing the sun. Traditionally, most houses have more windows in the front of the house with living spaces in the front and bedrooms in the back. So that would mean that in this grid, only the houses on the north side of the road would have optimum solar orientation and optimum window placement. Now, that's really variable because in many suburbs, a massive garage occupies the front of the house and there are more windows in the back. But the point is, take a look at where you live. Only 25% of the houses on average are optimally oriented with windows placed well for passive solar heating and cooling. Do you realize how much energy is wasted there? Over half of all energy used in a home is for heating and cooling space. It's mind boggling to think of the repercussions that placing houses on a grid has had for the environment, economy, and basic resilience of American infrastructure. It's literally a crime of ignorance because orienting houses properly is absolutely free. So imagine for a minute that in 1878, when Powell came out with watershed democracy, the US decided to pattern political boundaries on watershed boundaries. And the geomorphic design was embedded in the very fabric of all development. And the people paid attention to where the sun rises and sets. Think about how differently things would be here if we lived in a pattern that was designed with the shapes and forms of nature instead of a grid imposed over them. I honestly think we'd be living in a completely different and better reality. Now, I'm not saying that this layer of property division and water management would solve everything. There are many other factors needed to balance out the equation of creating a benevolent and equitable society, and addressing this mistake is only one of them. But shit, man, that was a huge mistake.